Everything that is true about God finds its fullest expression in the gospel that saves undeserving sinners and transforms them into loving, adoring children who are heirs. This power that Paul describes here, this great immensity, this magnitude of the power of God that Paul has described, Paul wants us to see that this power is focused toward us. Or if you're reading this morning in the King James, you have the delightful pleasure of coming across that word that you've never seen in any other context, usward, which is a wonderful little word that describes what Paul's saying here, usward or toward us, as our modern translations will put it, that the power of God, this power that Paul's speaking of, is directed toward us. When he wants to describe the immensity of God's power, he wants to use an illustration of God's manifesting of that power. He wants to illustrate that. He wants to communicate the grandest, the biggest understanding of power that he can, And think of how Paul could have illustrated that. Paul could have talked about the power of God in creation. And that's usually what we want to talk. When we want to talk about our God as being powerful, our God is strong, our God cannot be defeated, what do we talk about? Look at what he made. Look at the creation. Look at the beauty of the creation, the size. We we talk about the, the size of the universe and the stars that he put into place. Or we think about the words of Job where God told the sea that this is where you stop, no more. Or the life that God has created. All these things that God has created in, in creation. And all of them, remember, out of nothing. God didn't just refashion other things to be nicer, better more advanced things. God created everything from nothing. He spoke into existence everything that exists. And so when Paul wants to illustrate or talk about the manifested power of God, he could talk about creation, the power of God as demonstrated in what he has created, but he doesn't. He could have also talked about God's power in providence. Providence is that Just that fancy word that tells us that, as Paul said a little bit earlier in the passage, that he works all things according to the counsel of his will. God has a will, and he is bringing about his will by means of what we call providence. That means that God is in control of all things. He is in control of the weather and the creation, and and ultimately he's in control of culture. And he's working all of those things together for his decreed will. That is a phenomenal understanding of the power of God. If you understand a God that works all things together as he would have them be worked. That is an incredible statement of the power of God. And so Paul could have described the power of God manifested in his providential directing of all things. But when Paul wants to describe the manifested, the displayed power of God, where does he go? He goes to the power of God as illustrated in the salvation of lost sinners. That's astounding. That Paul considers the greatest manifestation of the power of God to be his work of saving a lost sinner of taking a lost sinner who is his declared enemy and making him to be his loving adopted child and heir. Paul says that is the greatest display of the power of God that I can point you to. Next week we'll get into this even more as this is where Paul really goes to talk about the power of God in the resurrection of Christ and the seating of Christ at power. But all of that is geared toward our completed final salvation. And so Paul says, this is the clearest, the greatest way that I can communicate to you of the power of God is in His power to save lost sinners. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It was revealed to them, the prophets of old, that they were serving not themselves but you, and the things that they have now, have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And here it is, 
things into which angels longed to look. Or Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 13, again speaking of the prophets of old, He says, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see. This magnificent thing called the gospel of salvation. The gospel in which it is declared to us that God makes His enemies to be His children, to be His adopted heirs by means of becoming their sin for them and going to the cross and being punished for their sin so that the righteousness of His perfect life is then credited or accounted to them who believe so that not only are they then forgiven of their sin while simultaneously their sin is judged properly, but they also become the objects of His love and eternal grace and devotion. Paul says that is the greatest demonstration of the power of God that I can point you to. Everything that is true about God, everything that is true about His character, everything that is true about His power, everything that is true about God finds its fullest expression in the gospel that saves undeserving sinners and transforms them into loving, adoring children who are heirs. Did you catch that? Because that was a lot. Everything, everything about the character of God and the power of God finds its fullest, most complete expression in the gospel in which God Himself sacrifices His his righteousness on the cross, becoming the sin of His enemies to simultaneously through faith, give to those who believe the righteousness of His Son so that they are credited as righteous while He is credited as a sinner and punished in their place in order to make His enemies His beloved and adoring children and heirs. That is the clearest, fullest, and greatest display of who God is. That is a staggering thing. That is a staggering truth that the greatest display of our God is this gospel. Now that leads us to a couple of other conclusions. The first is this. If the greatest, fullest display of God's power, as Paul says, if the greatest and fullest display of God's power is the gospel to save sinners from their sin, then your understanding and your perception of the greatness and the power of God hang on your perception of sin. Unless you grasp the depravity that is you, you cannot understand the power that is Him. If you see the sin in your life as shortcomings and failings and things that God can overlook and mistakes that you've made along. Nobody's perfect after all. If that describes your view of sin, am I making this up? Paul says you cannot understand the power of God. Because if that is your understanding of sin, then His greatest demonstration of power didn't save you from a whole lot. But in order to understand who God is and particularly the power of God, we must preach what sin is, what depravity is, what sin has done to us, how it has distorted His entire creation, how it has perverted us down to our very core and affected every part of us, that we are not just basically good people that need a little bit of help from God, We are hopeless, hopeless sinners who, as Paul will say in the next chapter, had no hope whatsoever. Unless we can grasp that, then we cannot grasp the power of this God that Paul is describing here in verses 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. 
The other thing that we see here is this power is directed toward those who believe, specifically those who are presently believing. Paul says this, that you may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. That word believe in the original is present participle. You know what a present participle is? It is a verb form that indicates present and ongoing activity. Present and ongoing activity, like I could say right now, I am walking across the podium. That means I'm doing something and I'm continuing to do it. Now I'd have to say, I walked across the podium. But Paul says, present participle, those who are in the, in the process of believing right now, that is the one toward whom the power of God is working. So at least a couple of things this tells us, a, a couple of groups that this excludes from us. There, there are at least two groups of people that this necessarily means that the power of God is not working towards in order to secure their eternal complete salvation. The first group would be a group of people that we would think of as sincere followers of false religions. Sincere followers of false religions. Now, there are followers of false religions that is, quite frankly, it's pretty easy for us to consider them to be people that are outside the grace of God. You know, think of, of the extreme Islamist who is promoting jihad and this sort of thing. It's easy to think of, of that type of person as outside the grace of God. I'm not talking about that. But we all know people who are followers of false religion whom we like. They are likable people. They are good people. They are kind people. Okay, right now, Mormons. I've never known a Mormon that wasn't likable. Have you? They're very like, kind, giving, helpful, just likable people who are following a false religion. We have a tendency down deep in our heart that when we like someone, we tend to think of them as being in the grace of God. When someone is a loved one, we tend to think of them as being in the grace of God or someone who, who we know to be following a false religion. We have a way of convincing ourselves that they're in the grace of God. They're, they're sincere people. They're good people. How many times have we said this? They're good people. Yet Paul says there is one group of people toward whom the power of God is working, and that is the group of people that are actively believing right now. In the name of Jesus, Acts 4 verse 12, there is given under heaven one name by whom we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. Outside of conscious belief in Jesus Christ by name, this power is not working towards anyone. It's working towards those who believe upon the name and are now believing upon the name. What a stark reminder from Paul here to remind us that the group of people towards whom the power of God is working are those who are believing right now upon the name of Jesus Christ. The other group that it would exclude would be the group of people who at some point in their life have professed a faith in Jesus Christ. But again, Paul tells us clearly, the group of people toward whom the power of God is at work is the group of people that are believing right now. The only proof that you have ever believed upon Jesus is if you're believing right now. The only proof that you're in the group of people that God's power is working toward is if you are, as Paul says, present participle, believing right now. That's a hard truth for some of us to face. All of us have people in our life that we know and we love who fall outside of that category of people. And we want so desperately to think of them as somehow still being in the grace of God. 
We'll think of some profession that was made 25 years ago, and yet there's been no evidence of fruit. They have nothing to do with the bride of Christ. But our hearts so desperately want to think of them as being in the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, let Scripture define for us whom God's power works towards. It's towards those who believe actively and consciously upon the name of Jesus Christ right now. Number three, we see that Paul is saying to us that the purpose of this section, the purpose of this power is to ensure every believer's realization and full enjoyment of completed salvation. Now that's something, at the end of that statement, we need to say, wow. This immenseness of power, this greatness of power, as we talked about before, how Paul is just trying to pile up descriptors to say, I'm I'm talking to you about the greatest power possible. This power is working toward the realization, the attainment of the full enjoyment of our completed salvation. Is that not something that should stagger us? That the full power of God is coming to bear to bring to absolute certainty the eternal enjoyment and satisfaction and pleasure of our inheritance. That's something that should absolutely stagger the believer. I mean, yeah, the power of God that's at work to bring about His glory, yes. The power of God that's that's at work to bring about His will, yes. The power of God that's, that's at work in His world to bring about the things that He's decreed, yes. But the power of God that is at work in its full orbed power to bring about our enjoyment of Him, our enjoyment of our eternal hope and blessing and inheritance, It's the realization of this truth that makes it an absolute contradiction to speak of a Christian who is hesitant, fearful, or doubtful. Doesn't that just make that into a contradiction? Someone who is the recipient, someone who is the one toward whom this power is working, who would then have a heart that's fearful or doubtful or or hesitant, or vacillating in any way. And we all do. We all have that heart. But can't you see what a contradiction it is to be the object toward what, towards which this power is working to bring about your eternal joy and at the same time reserve fears in your heart, reserve hesitancy in your heart, or, or a vacillating heart. Romans chapter 8. We know these words. Now, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. No plotting of evil men, no schemes of demons can separate us from the complete working out of God's plan of your eternal enjoyment of maximum joy in the Lord. 